The Crown of Wild Olive, by John Ruskin. Lecture 2. Traffic. Delivered in the Town Hall, Bradford. My good Yorkshire friends, you ask me down here among your hills that I might talk to you about this exchange you are going to build, but earnestly and seriously asking you to pardon me, I am going to do nothing of the kind. I cannot talk, or at least can say very little, about this same exchange. I must talk of quite other things, though not willingly, I could not deserve your pardon, if when you invited me to speak on one subject, I willfully spoke on another. But I cannot speak, to purpose, of anything about which I do not care. And most simply and sorrowfully I have to tell you, in the outset, that I do not care about this exchange of yours. If, however, when you sent me your invitation, I had answered, I won't come, I don't care about the exchange of Bradford, you would have been justly offended with me, not knowing the reasons of so blunt a carelessness. So I have come down, hoping that you will patiently let me tell you why, on this, and many other such occasions, I now remain silent, when formerly I should have caught at the opportunity of speaking to a gracious audience. In a word, then, I do not care about this exchange, because you don't. And because you know perfectly well I cannot make you. Look at the essential circumstances of the case, which you, as businessmen, know perfectly well, though perhaps you think I forget them. You are going to spend 30,000 liters, which to you, collectively, is nothing. The buying a new coat is, as to the cost of it, a much more important matter of consideration to me than building a new exchange is to you. But you think you may as well have the right thing for your money. You know there are a great many odd styles of architecture about. You don't want to do anything ridiculous, you hear of me, among others, as a respectable architectural man milliner, and you send for me, that I may tell you the leading fashion, and what is, in our shops, for the moment, the newest and sweetest thing in pinnacles. Now, pardon me for telling you frankly, you cannot have good architecture merely by asking people's advice on occasion. All good architecture is the expression of national life and character, and it is produced by a prevalent and eager national taste, or desire for beauty. And I want you to think a little of the deep significance of this word taste, for no statement of mine has been more earnestly or oftener controverted than that good taste is essentially a moral quality. No, say many of my antagonists, taste is one thing, morality is another. Tell us what is pretty, we shall be glad to know that, but preach no sermons to us. Permit me, therefore, to fortify this old dogma of mine somewhat. Taste is not only a part and an index of morality it is the only morality. The first, and last, and closest trial question to any living creature is, what do you like? Tell me what you like, and I'll tell you what you are. Go out into the street, and ask the first man or woman you meet, what their taste is, and if they answer candidly, you know them, body and soul. You, my friend in the rags, with the unsteady gait, what do you like? A pipe and a quartern of gin. I know you. You, good woman, with a quick step and tidy bonnet, what do you like? A swept hearth and a clean tea table, and my husband opposite me, and a baby at my breast. Good, I know you also. You, little girl with the golden hair and the soft eyes, what do you like? My canary, and a run among the wood hyacinths. You, little boy with the dirty hands and the low forehead, what do you like? A shy at the sparrows, and a game at pitch farthing. Good. We know them all now. What more need we ask? Nay, perhaps you answer, we need rather to ask what these people and children do, than what they like. If they do right, it is no matter that they like what is wrong, and if they do wrong, it is no matter that they like what is right. Doing is the great thing, and it does not matter that the man likes drinking, so that he does not drink, nor that the little girl likes to be kind to her canary, if she will not learn her lessons, nor that the little boy likes throwing stones at the sparrows, if he goes to the Sunday school. Indeed, for a short time, and in a provisional sense, 
this is true. For if, resolutely, people do what is right, in time they come to like doing it. But they only are in a right moral state when they have come to like doing it, and as long as they don't like it, they are still in a vicious state. The man is not in health of body who is always thirsting for the bottle in the cupboard, though he bravely bears his thirst, but the man who heartily enjoys water in the morning and wine in the evening, each in its proper quantity and time. And the entire object of true education is to make people not merely do the right things, but enjoy the right things not merely industrious, but to love industry not merely learned, but to love knowledge not merely pure, but to love purity not merely just, but to hunger and thirst after just ice. But you may answer or think, is the liking for outside ornaments, for pictures, or statues, or furniture, or architecture, a moral quality? Yes, most surely, if a rightly set liking. Taste for any pictures or statues is not a moral quality, but taste for good ones is. Only here again we have to define the word good. I don't mean by good, clever, or learned or difficult in the doing. Take a picture by tenures, of sots quarreling over their dice, it is an entirely clever picture, so clever that nothing in its kind has ever been done equal to it. But it is also an entirely base and evil picture. It is an expression of delight in the prolonged contemplation of a vile thing, and delight in that is an unmannered, or immoral quality. It is bad taste in the profoundest sense it is the taste of the devils. On the other hand, a picture of Titians, or a Greek statue, or a Greek coin, or a Turner landscape, expresses delight in the perpetual contemplation of a good and perfect thing. That is an entirely moral quality it is the taste of the angels. And all delight in art, and all love of it, resolve themselves into simple love of that which deserves love. That deserving is the quality which we call loveliness, we ought to have an opposite word, hateliness, to be said of the things which deserve to be hated. And it is not an indifferent nor optional thing whether we love this or that, but it is just the vital function of all our being. What we like determines what we are, and is the sign of what we are, and to teach taste is inevitably to form character. As I was thinking over this, in walking up Fleet Street the other day, my eye caught the title of a book standing open in a bookseller's window. It was on the necessity of the diffusion of taste among all classes. Ah, I thought to myself, my classifying friend, when you have diffused your taste, where will your classes be? The man who likes what you like, belongs to the same class with you, I think. Inevitably so. You may put him to other work if you choose. But, by the condition you have brought him into, he will dislike the other work as much as you would yourself. You get hold of a scavenger, or a costermonger, who enjoyed the Newgate calendar for literature, and pop goes the weasel for music. You think you can make him like Dante and Beethoven? I wish you joy of your lessons, but if you do, you have made a gentleman of him he won't like to go back to his costermongering. And so completely and unexceptionally is this so, that, if I had time tonight, I could show you that a nation cannot be affected by any vice, or weakness, without expressing it, legibly, and forever, either in bad art, or by want of art. And that there is no national virtue, small or great, which is not manifestly expressed in all the art which circumstances enable the people possessing that virtue to produce. Take, for instance, your great English virtue of enduring and patient courage. You have at present in England only one art of any consequence that is, iron working. You know thoroughly well how to cast and hammer iron. Now, do you think in those masses of lava which you build volcanic cones to melt, and which you forge at the mouths of the infernos you have created? Do you think, on those iron plates, your courage and endurance are not written forever not merely with an iron pen, but on iron parchment? And take also your great English vice European vice vice of all the world vice of all other worlds that roll or shine in heaven, bearing with them yet the atmosphere of hell the vice of jealousy, which brings competition into your commerce, treachery into your councils, and dishonor into you. Your wars that vice which has rendered for you, and for your next neighboring nation, 
the daily occupations of existence no longer possible, but with the mail upon your breasts and the sword loose in its sheath. So that, at last, you have realized for all the multitudes of the two great peoples who lead the so-called civilization of the earth, you have realized for them all, I say, in person and in policy, what was once true only of the rough border riders of your Cheviot hills they carved it. Tea the meal with gloves of steel, and they drank the red wine through the helmet bardi, do you think that this national shame and dastardliness of heart are not written as legibly on every rivet of your iron armor as the strength of the right hands that forged it? Friends, I know not whether this thing be the more ludicrous or the more melancholy. It is quite unspeakably both. Suppose, instead of being now sent for by you, I had been sent for by some private gentleman, living in a suburban house, with his garden separated only by a fruit wall from his next door neighbors, and he had called me to consult with him on the furnishing of his drawing room. I begin looking about me, and find the walls rather bare, I think such and such a paper might be desirable perhaps a little fresco here and there on the ceiling a damask curtain or so at the windows. Ah, says my employer, damask curtains, indeed. That's all very fine, but you know I can't afford that kind of thing just now. Yet the world credits you with a splendid income. Ah, yes, says my friend, but do you know, at present, I am obliged to spend it nearly all in steel traps. Steel traps, for whom? Why, for that fellow on the other side the wall, you know, we're very good friends, capital friends, but we are obliged to keep our traps set on both sides of the wall, we could not possibly keep on friendly terms without them, and our spring guns. The worst of it is, we are both clever fellows enough, and there's never a day passes that we don't find out a new trap, or a new gun barrel, or something, we spend about 15 millions a year each in our traps, take it all together, and I don't see how we're to do with less. A highly comic state of life for two private gentlemen. But for two nations, it seems to me, not wholly comic. Bedlam would be comic, perhaps, if there were only one madman in it, and your Christmas pantomime is comic, when there is only one clown in it. But when the whole world turns clown, and paints itself red with its own heart's blood instead of vermilion, it is something else than comic, I think. Mind, I know a great deal of this is play, and willingly allow for that. You don't know what to do with yourselves for a sensation, fox hunting and cricketing will not carry you through the whole of this unendurably long mortal life, you liked pop guns when you were schoolboys, and rifles and armstrongs are only the same things better made, but then the worst of it is, t. Had what was play to you when boys, was not play to the sparrows, and what is play to you now, is not play to the small birds of state neither, and for the black eagles, you are somewhat shy of taking shots at them, if I mistake not. I must get back to the matter in hand, however. Believe me, without farther instance, I could show you, in all time, that every nation's vice, or virtue, was written in its art, the soldiership of early Greece, the sensuality of late Italy, the visionary religion of Tuscany, the splendid human energy and beauty of Venice. I have no time to do this tonight, I have done it elsewhere before now, but I proceed to apply the principle to ourselves in a more searching manner. I notice that among all the new buildings that cover your once wild hills, churches and schools are mixed in due, that is to say, in large proportion, with your mills and mansions and I notice also that the churches and schools are almost always gothic, and the mansions and mills are never gothic. Will you allow me to ask precisely the meaning of this? For, remember, it is peculiarly a modern phenomenon. When gothic was invented, houses were gothic as well as churches, and when the Italian style superseded the gothic, churches were Italian as well as houses. If there is a Gothic spire to the Cathedral of Antwerp, there is a Gothic belfry to the Hotel de Ville at Brussels, if Inigo Jones builds an Italian Whitehall, Sir Christopher Wren builds an Italian St. Paul's. But now you live under one school of architecture, and worship under another. What do you mean by doing this? Am I to understand that you are thinking of changing your architecture back to Gothic, 
and that you treat your churches experimentally, because it does not matter what mistakes you make in a church? Or am I to understand that you consider Gothic a preeminently sacred and beautiful mode of building, which you think, like the fine frankincense, should be mixed for the tabernacle only, and reserved for your religious services? For if this be the feeling, though it may seem at first as if it were graceful and reverent, you will find that, at the root of the matter, it signifies neither more nor less than that you have separated your religion from your life. For consider what a wide significance this fact has. And remember that it is not you only, but all the people of England, who are behaving thus just now. You have all got into the habit of calling the church the house of God. I have seen, over the doors of many churches, the legend actually carved, this is the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Now, note where that legend comes from, and of what place it was first spoken. A boy leaves his father's house to go on a long journey on foot, to visit his uncle. He has to cross a wild hill desert, just as if one of your own boys had to cross the wolds of Westmoreland, to visit an uncle at Carlisle. The second or third day your boy finds himself somewhere between Haas and Brough, in the midst of the moors, at sunset. It is stony ground, and boggy. He cannot go one foot farther that night. Down he lies, to sleep, on worn side, where best he may, gathering a few of the stones together to put under his head, so wild the place is, he cannot get anything but stones. And there, lying under the broad night, he has a dream. And he sees a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reaches to heaven, and the angels of God are ascending and descending upon it. And when he wakes out of his sleep, he says, How dreadful is this place, surely, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. This place, observe, not this church, not this city, not this stone, even, which he puts up for a memorial the piece of flint on which his head has lain. But this place, this windy slope of Warnside, this moorland hollow, torrent bitten, snow blighted. This any place where God lets down the ladder. And how are you to know where that will be? Or how are you to determine where it may be, but by being ready for it always? Do you know where the lightning is to fall next? You do know that, partly, you can guide the lightning. But you cannot guide the going forth of the spirit, which is that lightning when it shines from the east to the west. But the perpetual and insolent warping of that strong verse to serve a merely ecclesiastical purpose, is only one of the thousand instances in which we sink back into gross Judaism. We call our churches temples. Now, you know, or ought to know, they are not temples. They have never had, never can have, anything whatever to do with temples. They are synagogues gathering places where you gather yourselves together as an assembly. And by not calling them so, you again miss the force of another mighty text Thou, when thou prayest, shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the churches we should translate it, that they may be seen of men. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is, not in chancel nor in aisle, but in secret. Now, you feel, as I say this to you I know you feel as if I were trying to take away the honor of your churches. Not so. I am trying to prove to you the honor of your houses and your hills, I am trying to show you not that the church is not sacred but that the whole earth is. I would have you feel, what careless, what constant, what infectious sin there is in all modes of thought, whereby, in calling your churches only holy, you call your hearths and homes profane and have separated yourselves from the heathen by casting all your household gods to the ground, instead of recognizing, in the place of their many and feeble lorries, the presence of your one and mighty Lord and Lar. But what has all this to do with our exchange, you ask me, impatiently? My dear friends, it has just everything to do with it, on these inner and great questions depend all the outer and little ones. And if you have asked me down here to speak to you, because you had before been interested in anything I have written, you must know that all I have yet said about architecture was to show this. 
The book I called The Seven Lamps was to show that certain right states of temper and moral feeling were the magic powers by which all good architecture, without exception, had been produced. The Stones of Venice, had, from beginning to end, no other aim than to show that the Gothic architecture of Venice had arisen out of, and indicated in all its features, a state of pure national faith, and of domestic virtue. And that its Renaissance architecture had arisen out of, and in all its features indicated, a state of concealed national infidelity, and of domestic corruption. And now, you ask me what style is best to build in. And how can I answer, knowing the meaning of the two styles, but by another question do you mean to build as Christians or as infidels? And still more do you mean to build as honest Christians or as honest infidels? As thoroughly and confessedly either one or the other? You don't like to be asked such rude questions. I cannot help it, they are of much more importance than this exchange business, and if they can be at once answered, the exchange business settles itself in a moment. But, before I press them farther, I must ask leave to explain one point clearly. In all my past work, my endeavor has been to show that good architecture is essentially religious the production of a faithful and virtuous, not of an infidel and corrupted people. But in the course of doing this, I have had also to show that good architecture is not ecclesiastical. People are so apt to look upon religion as the business of the clergy, not their own, that the moment they hear of anything depending on religion, they think it must also have depended on the priesthood. And I have had to take what place was to be occupied between these two errors, and fight both, often with seeming contradiction. Good architecture is the work of good and believing men. Therefore, you say, at least some people say, good architecture must essentially have been the work of the clergy, not of the laity. No a thousand times no, good architecture has always been the work of the commonalty, not of the clergy. What, you say, those glorious cathedrals the pride of Europe did their builders not form Gothic architecture? No, they corrupted Gothic architecture. Gothic was formed in the Baron's castle, and the Burgers Street. It was formed by the thoughts and hands and powers of free citizens and soldier kings. By the monk it was used as an instrument for the aid of his superstition. When that superstition became a beautiful madness, and the best hearts of Europe vainly dreamed and pined in the cloister, and vainly raged and perished in the crusade through that fury of perverted faith and wasted war, the Gothic rose also to its loveliest, most fantastic, and, finally, most foo. Lish dreams, and, in those dreams, was lost. I hope, now, that there is no risk of your misunderstanding me when I come to the gist of what I want to say tonight when I repeat, that every great national architecture has been the result and exponent of a great national religion. You can't have bits of it here, bits there you must have it everywhere, or nowhere. It is not the monopoly of a clerical company it is not the exponent of a theological dogma it is not the hieroglyphic writing of an initiated priesthood. It is the manly language of a people inspired by resolute and common purpose, and rendering resolute and common fidelity to the legible laws of an undoubted God. Now, there have as yet been three distinct schools of European architecture. I say, European because Asiatic and African architectures belong so entirely to other races and climates, that there is no question of them here. Only, in passing, I will simply assure you that whatever is good or great in Egypt and Syria and India, is just good or great for the same reasons as the buildings on our side of the Bosphorus. We Europeans, then, have had three great religions, the Greek, which was the worship of the God of wisdom and power, the medieval, which was the worship of the God of judgment and consolation, the Renaissance, which was the worship of the God of pride and beauty. These three we have had they are past, and now, at last, we English have got a fourth religion, and a God of our own, about which I want to ask you. But I must explain these three old ones first. I repeat, first, the Greeks essentially worshipped the God of wisdom. So that whatever contended against their religion, to the Jews a stumbling block, was, to the Greeks foolishness. The first Greek idea of deity was that expressed in the word, 
of which we keep the remnant in our words diurnal and divine the god of day, Jupiter the revealer. Athena is his daughter, but especially daughter of the intellect, springing armed from the head. We are only with the help of recent investigation beginning to penetrate the depth of meaning couched under the Athena symbols, but I may note rapidly, that her aegis, the mantle with the serpent fringes, in which she often, in the best statues, is represented as folding up her left hand for better. Guard, and the gorgon on her shield, are both representative mainly of the chilling horror and sadness, turning men to stone, as it were, of the outmost and superficial spheres of knowledge that knowledge which separates, in bitterness, hardness, and sorrow, the heart of the full-grown man from the heart of the child. For out of imperfect knowledge spring terror, dissension, danger, and disdain, but from perfect knowledge, given by the full revealed Athena, strength, and peace, in sign of which she is crowned with the olive spray, and bears the resistless spear. This, then, was the Greek conception of purest deity, and every habit of life, and every form of his art developed themselves from the seeking this bright, serene, resistless wisdom, and setting himself, as a man, to do things ever more rightly and strongly. 3. Not with any ardent affection or ultimate hope, but with a resolute and continent energy of will, as knowing that for failure there was no consolation, and for sin there was no remission. And the Greek architecture rose unerring, bright, clearly defined, and self-contained. Next followed in Europe the great Christian faith, which was essentially the religion of comfort. Its great doctrine is the remission of sins. For which cause it happens, too often, in certain phases of Christianity, that sin and sickness themselves are partly glorified, as if, the more you had to be healed of, the more divine was the healing. The practical result of this doctrine, in art, is a continual contemplation of sin and disease, and of imaginary states of purification from them. Thus we have an architecture conceived in a mingled sentiment of melancholy and aspiration, partly severe, partly luxuriant, which will bend itself to every one of our needs, and every one of our fancies, and be strong or weak with us, as we are strong or weak ourselves. It is, of all architecture, the basest, when base people build it of all, the noblest, when built by the noble. And now note that both these religions Greek and medieval perished by falsehood in their own main purpose. The Greek religion of wisdom perished in a false philosophy oppositions of science, falsely so called. The medieval religion of consolation perished in false comfort, in remission of sins given lyingly. It was the selling of absolution that ended the medieval faith. And I can tell you more, it is the selling of absolution which, to the end of time, will mark false Christianity. Pure Christianity gives her remission of sins only by ending them, but false Christianity gets her remission of sins by compounding for them. And there are many ways of compounding for them. We English have beautiful little quiet ways of buying absolution, whether in low church or high, far more cunning than any of Tetzel's trading. Then, thirdly, there followed the religion of pleasure, in which all Europe gave itself to luxury, ending in death. First, bows masks in every saloon, and then guillotines in every square. And all these three worships issue in vast temple building. Your Greek worshipped wisdom, and built you the Parthenon the Virgin's temple. The medieval worshipped consolation, and built you virgin temples also but to Our Lady of Salvation. Then the revivalist worshipped beauty, of a sort, and built you Versailles, and the Vatican. Now, lastly, will you tell me what we worship, and what we build? You know we are speaking always of the real, active, continual, national worship, that by which men act while they live, not that which they talk of when they die. Now, we have, indeed, a nominal religion, to which we pay tithes of property, and sevenths of time, but we have also a practical and earnest religion, to which we devote nine-tenths of our property and six-sevenths of our time. And we dispute a great deal about the nominal religion. But we are all unanimous about this practical one, of which I think you will admit that the ruling goddess may be best generally described as the goddess of getting on, 
or Britannia of the market. The Athenians had an Athena Agraea, or Minerva of the market, but she was a subordinate type of their goddess, while our Britannia Agraea is the principal type of ours. And all your great architectural works, are, of course, built to her. It is long since you built a great cathedral. And how you would laugh at me, if I proposed building a cathedral on the top of one of these hills of yours, taking it for an Acropolis. But your railroad mounds, prolonged masses of Acropolis, your railroad stations, vaster than the Parthenon, and innumerable. Your chimneys, how much more mighty and costly than cathedral spires. Your harbor piers, your warehouses, your exchanges. All these are built to your great goddess of getting on, and she has formed, and will continue to form, your architecture, as long as you worship her. And it is quite vain to ask me to tell you how to build to her, you know far better than I. There might indeed, on some theories, be a conceivably good architecture for exchanges that is to say if there were any heroism in the fact or deed of exchange, which might be typically carved on the outside of your building. For, you know, all beautiful architecture must be adorned with sculpture or painting, and for sculpture or painting, you must have a subject. And hitherto it has been a received opinion among the nations of the world that the only right subjects for either, were heroisms of some sort. Even on his pots and his flagons, the Greek put a Hercules slaying lions, or an Apollo slaying serpents, or Bacchus slaying melancholy giants, and earth-born despondencies. On his temples, the Greek put contests of great warriors in founding states, or of gods with evil spirits. On his houses and temples alike, the Christian put carvings of angels conquering devils, or of hero martyrs exchanging this world for another, subject inappropriate, I think, to our manner of exchange here. And the master of Christians not only left his followers without any orders as to the sculpture of affairs of exchange on the outside of buildings, but gave some strong evidence of his dislike of affairs of exchange within them. And yet there might surely be a heroism in such affairs. And all commerce become a kind of selling of doves, not impious. The wonder has always been great to me, that heroism has never been supposed to be in any wise consistent with the practice of supplying people with food, or clothes. But rather with that of quartering oneself upon them for food, and stripping them of their clothes. Spoiling of armor is an heroic deed in all ages, but the selling of clothes, old, or new, has never taken any color of magnanimity. Yet one does not see why feeding the hungry and clothing the naked should ever become base businesses, even when engaged in on a large scale. If one could contrive to attach the notion of conquest to them anyhow. So that, supposing there were anywhere an obstinate race, who refused to be comforted, one might take some pride in giving them compulsory comfort, and as it were, occupying a country with one's gifts, instead of one's armies. If one could only consider it as much a victory to get a barren field sown, as to get an eared field stripped, and contend who should build villages, instead of who should carry them. Are not all forms of heroism, conceivable in doing these serviceable deeds? You doubt who is strongest? It might be ascertained by push of spade, as well as push of sword. Who is wisest? There are witty things to be thought of in planning other business than campaigns. Who is bravest? There are always the elements to fight with, stronger than men, and nearly as merciless. The only absolutely and unapproachably heroic element in the soldier's work seems to be that he is paid little for it and regularly, while you traffickers and exchangers and others occupied in presumably benevolent business, like to be paid much for it and by chance. I never can make out how it is that a knight errant does not expect to be paid for his trouble, but a peddler errant always does, that people are willing to take hard knocks for nothing, but never to sell ribbons cheap. That they are ready to go on fervent crusades to recover the tomb of a buried god, never on any travels to fulfill the orders of a living god. That they will go anywhere barefoot to preach their faith, but must be well bribed to practice it, and are perfectly ready to give the gospel gratis, but never the loaves and fishes. If you chose to take the matter up on any such soldierly principle, to do your commerce, 
and your feeding of nations, for fixed salaries. And to be as particular about giving people the best food, and the best cloth, as soldiers are about giving them the best gunpowder, I could carve something for you on your exchange worth looking at. But I can only at present suggest decorating its frieze with pendant purses. And making its pillars broad at the base for the sticking of bills. And in the innermost chambers of it there might be a statue of Britannia of the market, who may have, perhaps advisably, a partridge for her crest, typical at once of her courage in fighting for noble ideas. And of her interest in game, and round its neck the inscription in golden letters, Perdix Fovit qui non pepperit for then, for her spear, she might have a weaver's beam. And on her shield, instead of her cross, the Milanese boar, semi-fleeced, with the town of Genesaret proper, in the field and the legend in the best market, and her corslet, of leather, folded over her heart in the shape of a purse, with thirty slits in it for a piece of money to go in at, on EAC. H day of the month. And I doubt not but that people would come to see your exchange, and its goddess, with applause. Nevertheless, I want to point out to you certain strange characters in this goddess of yours. She differs from the great Greek and medieval deities essentially in two things first, as to the continuance of her presumed power, secondly, as to the extent of it. First, as to the continuance. The Greek goddess of wisdom gave continual increase of wisdom, as the Christian spirit of comfort, or comforter, continual increase of comfort. There was no question, with these, of any limit or cessation of function. But with your agri goddess, that is just the most important question. Getting on but where to? Gathering together but how much? Do you mean to gather always never to spend? If so, I wish you joy of your goddess, for I am just as well off as you, without the trouble of worshipping her at all. But if you do not spend, somebody else will somebody else must. And it is because of this, among many other such errors, that I have fearlessly declared your so-called science of political economy to be no science, because, namely, it has omitted the study of exactly the most important branch of the business the study of spending. For spend you must, and as much as you make, ultimately. You gather corn will you bury England under a heap of grain, or will you, when you have gathered, finally eat? You gather gold will you make your house roofs of it, or pave your streets with it? That is still one way of spending it. But if you keep it, that you may get more, I'll give you more, I'll give you all the gold you want all you can imagine if you can tell me what you'll do with it. You shall have thousands of gold pieces, thousands of thousands millions mountains, of gold, where will you keep them? Will you put an Olympus of silver upon a golden pelion make Asa like a wart? Do you think the rain and dew would then come down to you, in the streams from such mountains, more blessedly than they will down the mountains which God has made for you, of moss and windstone? But it is not gold that you want to gather. What is it? Greenbacks. No, not those neither. What is it then is it ciphers after a capital I? Cannot you practice writing ciphers, and write as many as you want? Write ciphers for an hour every morning, in a big book, and say every evening, I am worth all those knots more than I was yesterday. Won't that do? Well, what in the name of Plutus is it you want? Not gold, not greenbacks, not ciphers after a capital I. You will have to answer, after all, no. We want, somehow or other, money's worth. Well, what is that? Let your goddess of getting on discover it, and let her learn to stay therein. Too but there is yet another question to be asked respecting this goddess of getting on. The first was of the continuance of her power. The second is of its extent. Pallas and the Madonna were supposed to be all the world's palace, and all the world's Madonna. They could teach all men, and they could comfort all men. But, look strictly into the nature of the power of your goddess of getting on. And you will find she is the goddess not of everybody's getting on but only of somebody's getting on. This is a vital, or rather deathful, distinction. 
examine it in your own ideal of the state of national life which this goddess is to evoke and maintain. I asked you what it was, when I was last here, five you have never told me. Now, shall I try to tell you? Your ideal of human life then is, I think, that it should be passed in a pleasant undulating world, with iron and coal everywhere underneath it. On each pleasant bank of this world is to be a beautiful mansion, with two wings, and stables, and coach houses, a moderately sized park, a large garden and hot houses, and pleasant carriage drives through the shrubberies. In this mansion are to live the favored votaries of the goddess. The English gentleman, with his gracious wife, and his beautiful family, always able to have the boudoir and the jewels for the wife, and the beautiful ball dresses for the daughters, and hunters for the sons, and a shooting in the highlands for himself. At the bottom of the bank, is to be the mill. Not less than a quarter of a mile long, with a steam engine at each end, and two in the middle, and a chimney three hundred feet high. In this mill are to be in constant employment from eight hundred to a thousand workers, who never drink, never strike, always go to church on Sunday, and always express themselves in respectful language. Is not that, broadly, and in the main features, the kind of thing you propose to yourselves? It is very pretty indeed seen from above, not at all so pretty, seen from below. For, observe, while to one family this deity is indeed the goddess of getting on, to a thousand families she is the goddess of not getting on. Nay, you say, they have all their chance. Yes, so has every one in a lottery, but there must always be the same number of blanks. Ah, but in a lottery it is not skill and intelligence which take the lead, but blind chance. What then? Do you think the old practice, that they should take who have the power, and they should keep who can, is less iniquitous, when the power has become power of brains instead of fist? And that, though we may not take advantage of a child's or a woman's weakness, we may of a man's foolishness? Nay, but finally, work must be done, and someone must be at the top, someone at the bottom. Granted, my friends. Work must always be, and captains of work must always be. And if you in the least remember the tone of any of my writings, you must know that they are thought unfit for this age, because they are always insisting on need of government, and speaking with scorn of liberty. But I beg you to observe that there is a wide difference between being captains or governors of work, and taking the profits of it. It does not follow, because you are general of an army, that you are to take all the treasure, or land, it wins, if it fight for treasure or land. Neither, because you are king of a nation, that you are to consume all the profits of the nation's work. Real kings, on the contrary, are known invariably by their doing quite the reverse of this, by their taking the least possible quantity of the nation's work for themselves. There is no test of real kinghood so infallible as that. Does the crowned creature live simply, bravely, unostentatiously? Probably he is a king. Does he cover his body with jewels, and his table with delicates? In all probability he is not a king. It is possible he may be, as Solomon was. But that is when the nation shares his splendor with him. Solomon made gold, not only to be in his own palace as stones, but to be in Jerusalem as stones. But even so, for the most part, these splendid kinghoods expire in ruin, and only the true kinghoods live, which are of royal laborers governing loyal laborers, who, both leading rough lives, establish the true dynasties. Conclusively you will find that because you are a king of a nation, it does not follow that you are to gather for yourself all the wealth of that nation. Neither, because you are king of a small part of the nation, and lord over the means of its maintenance over field, or mill, or mine, are you to take all the produce of that piece of the foundation of national existence for yourself. You will tell me I need not preach against these things, for I cannot mend them. No, good friends. I cannot, but you can, and you will, or something else can and will. Do you think these phenomena are to stay always in their present power or aspect? All history shows, on the contrary, that to be the exact thing they never can do. 
change must come, but it is ours to determine whether change of growth, or change of death. Shall the Parthenon be in ruins on its rock, and Bolton Priory in its meadow, but these mills of yours be the consummation of the buildings of the earth, and their wheels be as the wheels of eternity? Think you that men may come, and men may go, but mills go on forever? Not so. Out of these, better or worse shall come, and it is for you to choose which. I know that none of this wrong is done with deliberate purpose. I know, on the contrary, that you wish your workmen well. That you do much for them, and that you desire to do more for them, if you saw your way to it safely. I know that many of you have done, and are every day doing, whatever you feel to be in your power. And that even all this wrong and misery are brought about by a warped sense of duty, each of you striving to do his best, without noticing that this best is essentially and centrally the best for himself, not for others. And all this has come of the spreading of that thrice accursed, thrice impious doctrine of the modern economist, that to do the best for yourself, is finally to do the best for others. Friends, our great master said not so, and most absolutely we shall find this world is not made so. Indeed, to do the best for others, is finally to do the best for ourselves, but it will not do to have our eyes fixed on that issue. The pagans had got beyond that. Hear what a pagan says of this matter. Hear what were, perhaps, the last written words of Plato, if not the last actually written, for this we cannot know, yet assuredly in fact and power his parting words in which, endeavoring to give full crowning and harmonious close to all his thoughts, and to speak the sum of them by the Imagi. Ned's sentence of the great spirit, his strength, and his heart fail him, and the words cease, broken off forever. It is the close of the dialogue called Critias, in which he describes, partly from real tradition, partly in ideal dream, the early state of Athens. And the genesis, and order, and religion, of the fabled Isle of Atlantis. In which genesis he conceives the same first perfection and final degeneracy of man, which in our own scriptural tradition is expressed by saying that the sons of God intermarried with the daughters of men, for he supposes the earliest race to have been indeed the children of God. And to have corrupted themselves, until their spot was not the spot of his children. And this, he says, was the end. That indeed through many generations, so long as the God's nature in them yet was full, they were submissive to the sacred laws, and carried themselves lovingly to all that had kindred with them in divineness, for their uttermost spirit was faithful and true, and in every wise great. So that, in all meekness of wisdom, they dealt with each other, and took all the chances of life, and despising all things except virtue, they cared little what happened day by day, and bore lightly the burden of gold and of possessions. For they saw that, if only their common love and virtue increased, all these things would be increased together with them, but to set their esteem and ardent pursuit upon material possession would be to lose that first, and their virtue and affection together with it. And by such reasoning, and what of the divine nature remained in them, they gained all this greatness of which we have already told, but when the gods part of them faded and became extinct, being mixed again and again, and effaced by the prevalent mortality, and the human nature at last exceeded, they then became unable to endure the courses of fortune, and fell into shapelessness of life, and baseness in the sight of him who could see, having lost everything that was fairest of their honor. While to the blind hearts which could not discern the true life, tending to happiness, it seemed that they were then chiefly noble and happy, being filled with all iniquity of inordinate possession and power. Whereupon, the God of gods, whose kinghood is in laws, beholding a once just nation thus cast into misery, and desiring to lay such punishment upon them as might make them repent into restraining, gathered together all the gods into his dwelling place, which from heaven's center overlooks whatever has part in creation, and having assembled them, he said the rest is silence. So ended are the last words of the chief wisdom of the heathen, spoken of this idol of riches, this idol of yours. This golden image high by measureless cubits, set up where your green fields of England are furnace burnt into the likeness of the plain of Dura, this idol, forbidden to us, first of all idols, 
by our own master and faith. Forbidden to us also by every human lip that has ever, in any age or people, been accounted of as able to speak according to the purposes of God. Continue to make that forbidden deity your principal one, and soon no more art, no more science, no more pleasure will be possible. Catastrophe will come. Or worse than catastrophe, slow moldering and withering into Hades. But if you can fix some conception of a true human state of life to be striven for life for all men as for yourselves if you can determine some honest and simple order of existence. Following those trodden ways of wisdom, which are pleasantness, and seeking her quiet and withdrawn paths, which are peace.